afternoon. Okay, we'll try it one more time. This is a live environment. Good afternoon. This is not virtual, we are real. My name is Betsy Corcoran. I'm co-founder and CEO of EdSurge. I'm very happy to have you here in a real conversation about virtual stuff. Uh, we have a great panel, and because we spent a little time saying it's really hard to have this conversation without seeing anything. Before I introduce our people and we jump into the conversation, we're gonna show you three short video clips uh, of some of the things that we're gonna be talking about. So, roll clip number one, please. Going one, twice. That was Filament Labs. Next up, I believe we have a clip, a short clip from Microsoft. All these clips are one or two minutes, so they're pretty short. Uh, so we can roll clip number two. I was tired of preparing kids for yesterday. We were always preparing kids for this world that didn't really exist anymore and that wasn't going to exist when they graduated. And I wanted to get my kids to the point where they could actually build the future. We've seen a fundamental shift already in how a lot of educational resources are being delivered. We've seen a shift from print books through to ebooks. And I think the next evolution of that is from books to mixed reality. As I started preparing my lectures and thinking how I'm going to communicate this to the students, one thing I wished is I had a 3D chalkboard. You actually have all these tools that allow students to generate content for other students, which means that you could have students that are subject matter experts informing the development of experiences to help teach content that they're learning about in their other classes. And that's just amazing. With the whole our idea for an app was if you didn't have access to all different instruments, you could learn them. I feel like being able to interact with something is what makes you remember it more. I'm a visual learner. I'm someone who learns by experience as opposed to just reading out of a book. And so having the HoloLens put that visual in front of you makes things much easier. We could use mixed reality for agriculture, science classes, geography, math would be a big one. provides a much more engaging experience for students and that's the ultimate goal for a teacher is to engage the students and have them learning. Okay, that's Microsoft, thank you. And, okay. and we have one more clip. Transfer VR is precision measurement. This is an immersive is an absolute providing game changer. Hands -on interaction I've just been on the train for three hours and I could not take it off. It work. is incredible. Have so this is it. Log in. The Microsoft HoloLens. I've attached it to my laptop. <laughs> simulation begins with instruction to introduce a measurement tool and related concepts. During the instruction, the trainee interacts with the virtual coach to demonstrate initial understanding. The trainee then demonstrates their knowledge through hands-on practice. As the trainee answers correctly, they earn experience points. Each correct answer in a row adds to a trainee's streak. Trainees must earn enough experience points and complete a five-answer streak to complete the simulation. 
trainees earn bronze, silver, or gold badges based on their performance in the simulation. Trainees' progress data is stored and available for instructor review outside of VR. When a trainee completes all of the simulations, they are ready to demonstrate their knowledge in the real world. And our fourth panelist, uh, Nori from Japan, could you share? His work is so new, they don't have a video yet. They right. are just starting it. So just take one moment and sure. explain a little bit about what you're doing with ARVR in assessments. OK, so uh, my name is Nori. Uh, I flew in from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, basically, what we do in Japan is we provide prominent assessment solutions to the Ministry of Education. And also, we work closely with the largest uh, English aptitude test in Japan, which has about 2.4 test takers. So how we are going to use these XRs is that we have two initiatives at this moment. One is to use and see the possibility of using VR in assessment, especially in the English communication skills, where the interviews are necessary. And the second usage of the VR, where we're looking at is, is that another ministry that we work closely in Japan is the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, where they have a newest initiative called EdTech and Future Schools. So we're trying to look into how VR can be utilized in the normal classroom settings, as well as maybe in the future, classroom itself can be inside the VR. So these are the two initiatives that we're looking into. Perfect. Thank you very much. So as a longtime technology journalist, I've had a chance to interview lots and lots of entrepreneurs. And an entrepreneur once gave me, I thought, the best description of what an entrepreneur is. He said to me, I get a lot of tickets for going through red lights. And I said, OK, you clearly have a problem. You go through red lights all the time. Why do you do this? He said, because I'm always looking two blocks down the road at the next red light. And so I miss the red light in front of me. So that difference between imagining what the future is going to be and what it currently is, is what this panel is about. All right? So where is my leaping whale? This is the question that I have. We have been talking about AR and VR for a little while now. So I'd like to talk about the difference between what we imagine will be the leaping whale in the classroom and things like that, and where we are. H how distant are we between what we can do and that leaping whale? Ronnie, do you want to jump in? Oh, I was going to ask uh, Dan from Microsoft, since that's an AR, since the <laughs> leaping whale is an AR thing. <laughs> you get to go first. All right, great. Uh, so the leaping whale. <clears throat> So I think we've really just begun to scratch the surface as to what it can do, right? I think, and we talked about this, uh, I think, amongst ourselves a little bit, where uh, there are a lot of these expectations of what the technology is going to do and how amazing it can be and how um, immersive it can be. Um, I actually would go so far as to say I think we've done ourselves a bit of a disservice with that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, people see things like that, they see Ready Player One, and that's immediately to where their heads go to, like that's where the technology is today, that's where I can, what I can do. And then they put this, this headset on and they go into a very magical, fantastic experience that does not look like what they expected from, from some of this media. Um, and there's a bit of a, oh, this is cool, but I thought it was going to be something else. Um, I think the other thing I would add to that from an educational standpoint that has done a disservice is a lot of time has gone into those what I call showcase experiences. Um, you know, go down in the Titanic and check it out or, or things like that, that don't necessarily have educational value, that aren't aligned to standards and aren't helping educators do what they need to do with the technology. And that hasn't necessarily been helping either because what I've seen is educators try on that uh, device, they see that, it's like, yeah, this is cool, but that's not helping me teach what I need to teach. Um, so I, I think there is a bit of uh, a disconnect between those expectations right now. Right. We have two Dans on this panel. Yes, so keep it easy. Dan, if you want to just make <laughs> yep. sure I can keep you yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> so I mean, I think, it, first of all, it's important to distinguish between VR and AR when we talk about what's been delivered versus what is still firmly in the world of hype. And the whale is an AR phenomenon. And, uh, and while we're not there yet, uh, we, we are, I think, at that point, which is the point of presence with VR. 
in VR right now, you can go in and you can feel like you're someplace completely different, and that's a really powerful phenomenon, right? It's kind of, and in many ways, I like to think of it as like Diorama 2.0. Mm. Right, like there's something really powerful about getting off the couch, going to a museum, and standing in front of a diorama and feeling like you've been transported to another location or another time. And VR absolutely delivers on that right now. But we also have our blue, our, our whales in VR. Um, I suppose we want to continue that idea. And movement is definitely a big, a big one, right? Like anything that pulls you out of being present in that other space is is a whale. And right now, if you need to move from point A to point B, it's going to be a hack. You're probably going to teleport. If you don't teleport, you might vomit. You know, so there's <laughs> so there there are some issues to be worked out there. And there there are a couple different technologies that are working to enable people to walk in virtual space right now. They're all extremely silly looking. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you have any shred of pride, you probably won't use them. And they're all just, just impractical for another, a number of other reasons as well. But um, so, so, so there are, on the VR side of the equation, there are still a number of technological issues to work out. But I do think it's important to point out that I think the, the presence promise has been delivered. Presence promise is delivered. Yeah. Ronnie, what do, you, what do you think? Sure. So just real quick, by show of hands, does everyone know what we're talking about when we say the whale? I'm assuming. Everyone does. Does anyone not? So there's a very famous uh, Magic Leap video that shows a collection of kids in the auditorium, and uh, the, they're on the basketball court, and they're sitting there, and all of a sudden this amazing whale just leaps out of the floor. And, and it was with that whale leap that Magic Leap raised hundreds of millions of dollars um, to kind of start really developing a lot of these uh, XR kinds of technologies. Thank right. you. And so the whale captured a lot of people's imagination. For us, uh, we're in wor workforce development at, at Transfer VR. So our leaping whale, um, as it were, um, is that everybody gets a job and they're, they perform well on their job. And to answer your question about how far are we from that, that version of the leaping whale, we are uh, f very far. We are years away from that. Not because the technology doesn't exist, but because the technology hasn't really uh, like propagated or isn't readily available to everybody in everybody's hands. So we do uh, workforce job training simulations in VR um, with uh, a small group of companies because we just started. But um, you know what we've noticed is, it, you know, we, we did look at um, the Microsoft um, AR technology, uh, the HoloLens. Um, and we, we ultimately went, ended up going with the Oculus Rift be, for price reasons. Because for the jobs that we were training for, um, it was just less expensive to buy an Oculus Rift than, um, than, the, but the, uh, than the HoloLens, but the prices are coming down is where I'm going with this. And so because the, the price of all these hardware is coming down when we first started, it costed like you know, 1500 bucks to get started. Today it's 400 um, that makes it a lot more likely um, for us, for that, that whale, that magic whale, as it were, to um, become a reality for, for most folks. So this concept of the pre-apprenticeship program in VR is what we're trying to scale. And uh, we think we can get there, but it'll take a few years. OK. So let's talk about the next year, the next 12 months. So I'd love to hear from each of you over the next 12 months. What do you see your technology delivering or the assessments? What, what do you expect the experience in a classroom will be of someone using your technology literally in the next year? Dan, you want to? Sure, yeah. Um, I'll focus on the AR side since we have a couple of folks on the VR side. We have an a, um, a VR solution as well as an AR solution. Um, so what do I expect in the next 12 months? I would, uh, similarly to what you were just saying, I would say uh, continued adoption. We're starting to see it pop up more and more in classrooms. And I think there's And what are they using it for in classrooms? I mean, be real specific. Sure, um, so using HoloLens in particular, um, yeah. medical, uh, it's being used a lot to teach medical anatomy. Okay, so in, in medical particular. schools at a higher level. And even within, uh, we're even seeing them show up in secondary schools as well. And okay. anatomy is, is a really big thing that it's being used for, I think for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think one of the, I think AR and VR each have different strengths, right? Uh, I think one of- And maybe two. we should pause for a moment. Sure. Should we define AR and VR, the difference between the two? Let's do that. So why don't you define AR and then we'll let other people define VR? Sure, yeah, no, good, good catch. So basically what the HoloLens does, it's an augmented reality device that still gives you full spatial awareness. So you see holo holograms in your field of view. So for example, if I had one on my head right now, I could still see everybody in this room. Uh, but there could be holographic um, 
displays over it. So you still have full awareness within a classroom versus VR, which is completely immersive. Um, so what, what that lends in a classroom scenario is a lot of, uh, you've got the mobility because it's fully self-contained. So you can walk around entirely, you can see one another, and classes can work together on, on problems to, uh, uh, at the same time. So I think that next 12 months, we're going to continue to see it being adopted more and more. Because I think we're starting in both with AR and VR, you're starting to see more success cases that I think is getting away from some of the skepticism. Uh, you know, I have heard on both cases, like, where's the research that shows that this is better than traditional classroom mm -hmm. or other methods? Mm -hmm. And I think as time goes on, uh, you're starting to see more of those wins in both cases, both for AR and VR, that's helping to drive adoption. Excellent. And we are coming back to this outcomes in education <laughs> question. Don't worry. Dan, yeah, fill next. them in. So, so any other definition you want to add of a VR and then Again, what's going to happen in the next year with your Yeah, no, technology? it's exactly what other Dan said. I mean, it's <laughs> VR is very similar to AR, except you're more likely to lean on the virtual table and fall over or trip <laughs> on something because you can't see it. Although next, next round of the hardware, I think, as I understand it, will have a forward-facing camera, so when you want to, you can toggle between the two. Um, yeah, so next 12 months for film, so we actually, as of literally this morning, found out that we're going to uh, get three quarters of a million dollars from the National Science Foundation to uh, build out a robotics <laughs> So the, so the game they're going to be working on over the course of the next 12 months is basically a, game, a VR game designed to uh, not supplant uh, uh, physical robotics kits, but to augment them, and in particular to create a, a smoother on-ramp toward robotics for a broader diversity of people. So that brings me to this broader idea of what happens in the next 12 months, and that is that, and, and in education at large, and that is that VR moves from being something that's relatively static or passive to something that's highly interactive. So when we first started see, to see VR enter the classroom, we saw things like Google, uh, Google Classroom, Google Cardboard, uh, field trips where you would go someplace, you know, maybe you'd stand on the wall of China and you could look around 360 degrees, and then maybe you could start to experience those scenes in motion through 360 degree video. But ultimately, you were a passive consumer or some other place in some other time. And uh, my perspective on, on where VR is hopefully headed is that it's less important where you go, and it's actually more important what you do there, like any interactive technology. And so with, with Roboco, our entire mission with the, with the game is to create something that allows you to explore design thinking by actually doing design thinking in a virtual space over the course of the next 12 months. Okay, 12 months. Mm -hmm. How far will we get in assessments in the next sure, year? Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, of course the pilot will already be starting. Okay. And uh, because in terms of using VR in assessment, the scope is very, you know, concrete. So what we want to do is uh, we currently provide paper-based test and online-based uh, test first, but a secondary test will be done interviewed. And using human beings as a human rater is quite expensive, mm -hmm. as well as these human raters vary in their evaluation judgment. So using VR and replacing that is a very narrow scope that we think that is doable. Mm -hmm. And that's one area that we want to explore. But still, there are some hardware elements that we hope in the future will be implemented. Uh, for example, biometrics, because in, if you're talking about assessments, how do you prevent people from cheating? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you have uh, eye tracking uh, elements within the VR, maybe why don't you put the eyeless uh, recognizer? where you can, you know, identify certain people. Mm -hmm. But just so that we're 100% clear, when you talk about doing a VR assessment, and it's primarily starting with language That's right. assessment mm -hmm. at this point, so presumably you'd be assessing me in English or something. Mm -hmm. So right. so just describe what will that, how will that work? What, what's the, the uh, Sure, sure. Okay, so you'll be put into a situation uh, usually, uh, English aptitude assessments uh, have an al alignment to CFR. CFR is called Common European Frame of Reference. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a situation where, for example, you're, somebody comes up to you and asks, where's my car? Right. I kind of parked it. It's red. It's got to be somewhere around. So basically, VR takes the gyro you know, head position. And also, if you were to kind of pick up something, the VR will understand the position, mm -hmm. 
and also you have a microphone, mm -hmm. you have a, a speaker, mm -hmm. it's all there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of environment, immersive engagement environment that we want to give because these paper-based uh, uh, interviews where at this moment you kind of read out and you know, describe what's in there, but that's not real world, world. Right? right? So that's one that we'll be doing uh, within 12 months. Mm -hmm. And also uh, another one that we'll, we will be uh, testing out within this 12 months will be how to use VR in classrooms. And uh, also the, 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 the second one will be more difficult. Uh, how do you create a classroom environment in the VR? Mm. And that's close to like Ready Player One situation. And, uh, and having multiple people access at the same time with low latency. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as you know, in Tokyo, uh, Olympic is coming. So fifth generation network will be there. Yes. So we'll be using 5G to okay. test out. So you'll have a lot of bandwidth. Right. Okay. But you think we'll get this all done in a year? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, it's a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> We're not making a product yet. Okay. okay no product. Just a pilot. Uh, yeah. All right. What, 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 yeah. One thing I would add to that is, um, so the costs of hardware have come down a lot over the last few years. Um, I think over the next year, the quality of the experiences will uh, will improve, and the quality is already pretty good. So we we do this one. We have this one bartender trainer um, that our clients use, and this one gentleman was in it. He was, uh, you know, probably a little over fifty years old. And he was using, um, you know, he's making drinks in the bar and he was, I could see him like leaning, trying to lean on the bar. And I would tell him like, listen, there's no bar there. Like, <laughs> please do not lean on the bar. And he was like, okay, okay, okay. So like two minutes later, he leans on the bar uh -oh. and he falls flat on his forehead. And I like immediately like text our lawyer and I was like, listen, um, this guy <laughs> fell down. Like, are we, are we going to get in trouble? And so the quality is already good. But um, I think you'll see that, you know, three, a couple of years ago, people used to get sick in VR, get motion sickness. A lot of that has gone away. Yeah. I think that will continue. I'm not sure the hardware, how much the hardware price will go down much in the, in the next year. But the, I think the real thing to pay attention to is two to three years from now. Okay. Because two to three years from now, um, one of the biggest um, kind of drawbacks of VR right now is that while it looks real, it doesn't feel real, like your hands. Like you don't have tactile. Like when you pick up it's objects, they don't have the weight. Feeling on the bar. Yeah. Correct. And people are working like on really fantastic <laughs> solutions. Uh, well, sticky or smelly or whatever. Um, but people are working on solutions, like haptic solutions, where um, you can start to feel the weight of things, or they feel the objects that you touch in VR will feel like they do in real life. Okay. So I love this scenario. We're going to have the guy training to be a bartender. In, uh, in your environment, and uh, okay, hopefully in two to three years you have a lot of lawyers, so when they do this, <laughs> it's over, you're good, uh, we'll start to get sticky. But what is this going to cost? Because, gosh, can't I just go down to my local bar and train to be a bartender now? So how much is it costing per person to do this kind of training? And, and, and really, it's a question for all of you, how much is it gonna cost per kid to make this kind of experience available? Um, so I know in, in our instance, um, the, the cost, because we do job training, it does depend on the job. So it costs a little bit more to train, uh, you know, a nurse versus somebody who wants to be a welder or a HVAC type person. Um, but generally speaking, um, the cost should come down by at least a factor of 10. Okay, right? but so, what, give, give us a number right now. Um, you know, I think next year it's reasonable to get the cost to around 100 bucks a student. I think five to ten years from now, it should be around ten. Okay, a hundred bucks per student. Can you guys teach? Uh, and I'm class? talking about just the knowledge basis. So, like, how do you do things? Like, how do you run a lab, or how do you operate a crane, or how do you, you know, what, how do you do the techniques that a phlebotomist does? Okay, so this is the software side. This is not the hardware side. This is not the like certificate. Like, schools will still charge money for their degrees and certifications, and this is not that. This is just okay. to acquire the skills. Just to acquire the skills. Yeah, so yeah. On, the, on the hardware side, the costs are approaching the point where you could get a classroom set of devices for the same amount of money as, uh, as a single smart board. And smart boards have, have obviously not been, cost, or cost has not been the barrier to proliferation of smart boards by any means. So, that, that's so a couple thousand bucks then. Yeah. 
Yeah, a couple thousand bucks or less. And, and in particular, I mean, part of our business case for the robotics game is that um, the, the cost for a robotics kit per student is hundreds if not thousands of dollars. The parts get used up, the parts are not replaceable, the parts are finite, the parts break. Uh, only one kid can be using the parts at mm -hmm. a time. So there, there are definitely, I mean, right, like in any other field, there are, there are advantages to working with virtual tools as opposed to physical tools from a cost perspective. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Like a lot of times where we see, uh, particularly among the early adopters, is where you compare it to the cost of teaching it today. Mm -hmm. um, and in many cases, yeah, it is vastly cheaper. Uh, like even though, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, that sounds kind of expensive. When in the areas that are grabbing it today, when they counterbalance that to like how much does it cost us to teach it today, they are actually finding yeah, almost universally it's dramatically cheaper to go with a virtual solution. Because, and what are, they what are they giving up that they don't have to pay for then? So I'll, I, can, for, I always come back to the same example, I'm sorry. Skeleton. Cada cadavers, yeah. <laughs> so uh, like medical schools using HoloLenses, right? Like okay. the cost of maintaining a cadaver lab is ridiculously expensive okay. uh, versus the cost of using a HoloLens. Not only that physical cost of maintenance, but when students get access to it, because they're so costly in medical schools, students often don't get access to it till like second year or something like that, because you don't want a bunch of first years carving up one of these expensive things. Uh, a lot, those things go away. So I, what I'm seeing with both AR, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality is those earlier adopters are comparing the cost versus the way of doing it today. So robotics is another great example for VR. Can I also add to yes, this? Yes, please. Uh, so not the classroom usage, right? So assessment, why do we use assessments? Uh, use VR in assessments, why do we plan to use that? It's because we're providing an assessment which is uh, highly endorsed by the government. So we are constantly facing the government's pressure saying, why does your test and assessment so expensive? And usually this cost comes from human raters, for example, interviewers. There's no one interviewer. There's usually two int interviewers. But if you can replace that to VR and have a recorded voice and do that remotely, it just co cuts costs. And you know, that will benefit the test takers. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the business model that we're looking at. So let's talk a little bit about use of AR and VR as curriculum and learning outcomes. And Dan, you kind of got us started on this, right? What are the learning outcomes that we are looking for? You can, you can give me the cadaver example again. I'll stay away from that one. <laughs> that's, that's just like something else. But how are we measuring the learning outcomes of this technology and Maybe, Barani, we should start with you, because at least you are trying to train people for a job, right? Yeah, and so we'll be to we are totally upfront with all of our customers, and um, everybody understands this. Um, no one has done any real amount of research on using virtual reality in workforce development. So VR has been used in the military and all this stuff, and in games, blah, 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 but no one's actually proven that you can use virtual reality as a legitimate way to train someone for a job. So we are trying to do that. Um, and we are in the process of conducting our own pilot studies and efficacy, efficacy studies. And people are willing to take that risk um, with us because the current state of affairs in teaching and education and training is that people feel the education system is tapped out. Right now, about 50% of the people who graduate from high school are not going to go pursue a college degree those people still need to be employed. And so even though um, there's no real research basis for workforce development training in virtual reality, people are saying, we need to invest in this and try it because this 50% of the population that isn't you know, um, going to a four year uh, program isn't going away and we don't want them to become net consumers of social services. We've got to figure out how to get them to be contributors. And when you say we're willing, they're willing to take the risk, are they the, the employers? Are they the government? Are they the users? Who's, who's, who's we when we talk about willing to take the risk? That's a great question. So the users are the easiest to convince. Uh, they put on the VR, AR headsets and they're like, this is a zillion times better than PowerPoint. Please don't ever make me listen to a lecture ever again. Um, same with the trainers. I mean, when they see this, they're like, oh my gosh, I don't have to stand up in front of a, a, a group of young adults and like pretend I'm like, you know, an entertaining when, I, when I'm not, you know. Um, so the people that are taking risk, definitely the employers are taking a financial risk. They're also taking like a credibility risk because they're saying, hey, we're going to pilot this thing with this like small startup that nobody's ever heard of. Um, 
And then definitely the government is absolutely taking a risk because they are, they are spending uh, taxpayer dollars to pilot, uh, to pilot our stuff. And obviously they can, you know, the media or anyone wants to go after them for uh, spending money on unproven technologies they can. Um, so they're taking a reputational risk as well, I would say. But there's no, in terms of risk, there's no like uh, danger, um, well, except for the guy who fell down while bartending. Um, so there, there's a little bit of danger, but, um, but it's not but, life or death. But now you've encouraged me to go back to the cadavers because, yeah, Dan, I mean, if uh, you're going to train my doctor with VRAR, am I going to have confidence? Is this going to work? What's the evidence? So using the cadaver example, it is a combination. You still want that tactile notion. So folks are still using a combination. Where you do get to education, there are actually a number of uh, studies that show the efficiency of using both AR and VR in classical education scenarios. Um, and these are not like Microsoft studies. These are like peer reviewed studies by like Harvard, MIT, Oxford, things like that. Um, I, it's funny, I, I used to joke that no one would be shocked if I rolled up with a bunch of our own research that said this was fantastic. So uh, we've just been pulling research from other people. Um, and these, the, the facilities are basically doing A-B testing. So mm -hmm. if you, tr you, you cut a class in half, half goes through a traditional curriculum and testing methodology, the other half goes through it with either an AR or VR device, <laughs> and everybody takes the same test at the end of it. Uh, and then they're tested again several weeks later for retention. Like that's, that's generally how it goes. Um, at a high level, I'll give a high level and then some specific examples that we've seen. At a high level, we see numbers anywhere from 25 to 34% improvement in grades using AR or VR in educational settings versus traditional. And for any particular slice uh, or just across Not across, across the, board. the board, not related to any specific subjects. Um, some more Math, English? Uh, they've traditionally been done more around science, more around uh, science. Things okay. like, uh, notions like that where you can actually get a little more active. A couple of precise examples, and I'll use cadavers for one of them. Um, one, one university actually uh, did three semesters of A-B testing before adopting the HoloLens, and they found that uh, their students saw a full letter grade improvement when using the device versus traditional, uh, and they've now adopted uh, the, these devices into all of their courses. Um, the cadaver example, there's another, uh, there's a fun one where they, uh, they were already con completely convinced on the difference to grade, so they took a different tack. They wanted to see how much more quickly they could teach the same content using this because they had already proven to themselves that they were seeing uh, improvements in grades. And they actually found in A-B testing that they were actually able to get to almost equivalent grades in the two groups, they would define it as statistically insignificant, that the grades were almost identical, but in 60% less time using uh, an AR device. So that's opening up now all kinds of fantastic conversations around what do you do from a curriculum standpoint if this holds. And this is, uh, this is like, they, we've done three rounds, we've got a few more rounds to go. But that has vast implications from a curriculum standpoint if you can teach the same amount of curriculum in that much less time. So what shouldn't we do with AR and VR in education? You're looking right at me. I'm okay. looking right at you. <laughs> Well, so I, you know, so I guess to bring it back to the whale, you know, the, my big question after I saw that video was like, well, what, now what? Like, what happens now? So there's this concept of something called look and learn, which is like you, you look at a 3D object and somehow you learn something important about it. And that's why I keep coming back to this idea of interactivity, but not just any, any type of inter interactivity, particularly embodied interactivity. So actually the, the video that you showed, I think was like perfect. Like these are all disciplines where part of the cognition is coming from the player's head and part of the cognition is expressed through the player's body, the performance of the, of the task. There's an intelligence that lives in the actions that they physically take in the VR space. And that's where VR really, really shines, right? So in contrast, if somebody came to me and they said, I would like you to make a VR game about accounting, I would be concerned because that's an entirely disembodied, purely cognitive exercise. It actually has a game called VR Accounting. Uh, it's <laughs> nothing to do with accounting, right. trust me. And what about, what about literature then? I mean, should we, should we read the Canterbury Tales, which you could argue is disembodied, or are we supposed to experience the Canterbury Tales? Sure, I mean, so, you know, one of the examples that we showed in our real as a game where you learn about the life and times of three famous female scientists, right? And so, of course, I, I, I would support the idea that there is value to actually being in Jane Goodall's tent 
and feeling present uh, in, in the space that she operated in when she was doing her work, and that there's value from a learning perspective to having that experience. I'm just not claiming, I'm just not making the argument that's the pinnacle of the technology or where I think we ultimately Okay, so it's not great. Um, I think we're gonna have time for one or two questions. Uh, if we could have a quick mic up to the front, or you can stand up and you can shout, and I'll <laughs> shout back for you. So do we have, the question is, do we have the content? So it would be great, and all these things are possible, but do we have the content? I have an opinion on that. Yeah. Um, I think it. before you can have the content, you have to have the business model. I mean, I think if tons of people were making money on generating VR content, you'd have a lot more content developers. Um, so I think part of the reason why there might not be as much content, well, part of it in the past was the adoption of hardware. That's changing, but I think now it's going to be about how are people going to make money? Because if developers are making money, they're going to develop a ton of content for sure. I mean, yeah, I agree. I think there's certainly a chicken and egg thing um, at, a can um, at play there. Um, I have a couple of answers to that. I think there's uh, content and applicable content, right? Like going back to that standards aligned content, making sure that there, there's stuff out there that people can use. And then I would also argue content creation tools are somewhat lacking. I think, um, you know, I can go on forever about what I think are, are friction points to adoption. But right now, it is really hard for your average person to go ahead and create this kind of content. It is still somewhat bespoke. And I think that's another barrier to it as well. I do think the content's getting better and we're getting more standards aligned content, which is really, really helpful. But I would love to see more uh, the ability for anyone to create their own content in this space. So the cost may come down. The content may get developed. It may get better. We may find that we uh, have the ability to move. So my question is, what year are each of you dreaming of? What year, right? Will you have the AR VR system that is affordable for the classrooms in our world? Pick your year. And you gotta think and then just go one, two, three, four, pick your year. And you guys think about that too. Pick your year. Who's gonna go first? I'm going 2040. 2040. <laughs> Nori. Uh, assessment 2020. 2020, brave, okay. Six and a half years. Six and a half years, you're gonna make me do the math on that one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, six and a half years, We're right. we go for months now. Uh, I'm gonna say 2025. 2025, all and right. That, and I would add to that, that, and that's where I think you start to get uh, better artificial intelligence and machine learning woven into it as well, which is where I think you're really going to see the technology start to pop. Message to you all, session. come back here in 2025 or maybe 2020, <laughs> and we'll see where we are. Thank you very much. Thanks, panel.